Okay, so my name is Nicola, and uh, I'm the father of Axe. I started uh, programming that uh, a few years ago. So, first question you must ask is, uh, what is Axe? Okay, that's the typical first question. Uh, answer that is a cross-platform toolkit. So that's a lot of different words. What is cross-platform? What is a toolkit? Uh, Axe enables you to compile to many different platforms. A platform in terms of Axe is a given technology. So currently Axe supports compilation to C++, JavaScript, PHP, C Sharp, Java, Flash Swift, Neko VM, and Python. So that's uh, when you write something in Axe, you can generate code for all the following platforms. That's already quite a lot of things you can do there. We have one single language, which is the Axe language, and multi-platforms, which are we are generating code for. So one of the difference, for instance, between Axe and Java, is that Axe doesn't have a runtime. It's not a virtual machine that it's running on inside these platforms. Every platform, we are targeting it natively. So Axe is native everywhere. So when you target C++, you generate C++ code, and it's run into the C++. It's compiled by the C++ compiler, and it's running into the C++ environment. When you compile to Java, it's running on, on top of the, on the GVM. So it's trying to, for every platform we target, you are directly have access to the native layer, which is important for us. So we will see a uh, different thing in this talk. This is a bit of a roadmap. We saw the different uh, tools and libraries that we can use to, uh, to do uh, Axe. We'll lo have a look at what is a cross compiler and how it works. Uh, we look at the Axe standard library and how it's different from uh, the language standard library. We look at the language, uh, Axe as a language, how modern is it, what are the features. And uh, we explain also a bit about the way of thinking how Axe is different from other programming language. And since we like to do things a bit differently than other programming language, we we'll start from the bottom and move up down. Uh, my own experience with programming language I, is quite long. I, I started programming when I was 10, so I was not maybe very good at this time. And I, I, I've been learning a lot of programming language during these uh, past 25 years. Uh, I start with GWU Basic, which is very, very old language. Then Quick Basic, Turbo Pascal, Assembler, C, C++, Java, Lisp, OCaml, Perl, ActionScript, PHP, and a few more that I actually have been studying but not been using. This is the ones I've been using for something more than one year. And, um, and the others I've been studying are also not listed. So when you start learning several programming language, you start seeing things from patterns, some things that are the same. And you start also feeling some things are different between the language. But the core, I mean, the core thing about programming, when you learn several languages, the, the experience you get when you learn a language can be applied to other languages as well. Sometimes you will learn new features and you will like evolve yourself. You, uh, you will like learn new things and make things differently the way you were doing in the past. But most of the time, the language, uh, the, the core things of programming is the same. It's about al algorithms, it's about data structures, it's about, you know, expressing, uh, decomposing your, the, the things you want to do into uh, simple tasks that can be classes or code or whatever. Uh, after that, I did a lot of web development, uh, doing a lot of PHP, Flash, and JavaScript. And um, we had a lot of, uh, of code that we wanted to share between the client and the server. And uh, also we had, uh, we are a really small team at this time. So we wanted to, we are doing all of this, uh, like I was doing both client and server on my project. So you had to switch all the time between I'm doing PHP and then, okay, I have bugs to fix on the client and then again back to PHP and then, okay, this time it's JavaScript. And it's always like context switching in uh, in terms of uh, productivity is not very good. So we came up with the idea to, to build one single programming language that could s somehow target all these platforms. And then after that, uh, it's Axe. And then after that, more and more platforms have been added. 
I have been having it in the, in the years, and uh, we are we are not there. Um, this is a few goals we have uh, for Axe. The first one is to support all the mainstream platforms. So you shouldn't be limited in uh, anything you want to do when you use Axe. Uh, if there is a new platform tomorrow that is very popular and that people want to use it, it's quite simple for us to add this new platform support. We are already supporting a lot of different platforms, so adding a new one is a very small amount of work compared to the lot of work I've been doing into Axe. And we really want uh, people using Axe to be able to target everything they need. I think currently with all the targets we support, you can do pretty much anything you might think about with Axe. You can do mobile stuff, you can do desktop, you can do embed device, all the things. One of the things we want to do is to write once, reuse everywhere. Okay, that's different from the Java. You know, Java is like write once, run everywhere. It's like, but for us, it's not about running everywhere. It's about reusing the code. So it means that the code you write in Axe, you can also reuse it on different platforms. There is some guarantees, of course, that it will run the same. But you so you can also customize it. Uh, you can customize it for this particular platform. We'll see after that. Uh, we want to be always native, that whatever the platform you target, there is no wrapper, no things going on that makes the code slow compared to if you had written it directly for the platform. We want the code to be generated but readable. So it means the, the code that it uh, X generates had to be readable. You should be able to debug it to uh, do things with it. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's important. One of the things in important is that we, we trust the developer. When we make the language design, we think, okay, some of our language are protecting you against yourself. That's not our philosophy. We, we say, okay, people that use our language, that use Axe, of course you have a lot of compile time ch checking, about type checking and everything is going on. But we trust the developer. If the developer explicitly says something about something he want to do, then we let him do because he says so. We don't think we are. You need to. Uh, we need to protect uh, you against yourself. That's uh, we trust users. One of the last things is that we don't want to have you into some kind of vendor locking. Uh, there's a lot of technology, new technology coming coming up. Uh, when you start using, for instance, uh, Java, you have to use a GVM. When you start to use uh, well, JavaScript, have its own virtual machine. No, there is several implementations. But basically, when you start a new technology, usually there is a specific technology uh, given by a specific vendor that you have to, to use. Axe is open source software, entirely open source. It's on GitHub, all the source. And uh, we want to make sure that the users that are using Axe, they have, really have a big freedom of the kind of things they can do with the language, both in terms of platforms and in terms of you know, not being tied we're not Google, we're not Apple, we not, don't have any special relationship with them. So we, are, we can be uh, very fair about the platform we target. That's important for us. For X is used for what? So let's, let's look at an example. Prezi. Uh, do any of you know Prezi.com? Quite a lot. Okay, Prezi.com is a presentation software you can check on their website. It enables you to build presentation like PowerPoint kind of, but very different in the sense that you can create really uh, presentations that can zoom in and zoom out and a um, lot of different animations. It's very uh, a, a dynamic way to make presentation. They had this very huge client that they have been working on for years and they entirely re like uh, ported it to Axe uh, last year, in the past two years. And they are now running entirely into XJavaScript. So this is a notation we are using. XGS means that it's written in Axe, compiled to GS. Okay, so it's uh, it's as actually running on JavaScript virtual machine, but the whole uh, thing is written in Axe. So they are really happy with it. It's quite a lot of code, a lot of work, but now they can target HTML5. They can also, if they want, they can also still compile to Flash. They can compile to a mobile. That's really a huge step forward for them. And uh, of course, because of uh, the, like Axe is a 
is a strictly typed programming language. We saw that afterwards. Uh, it enables them to maintain very large code base uh, compared to JavaScript that's sometimes pretty hard to scale. So I, I say X is a model language. So let's, let's look, look at the bits as X uh, as a language. X is class-based, so you, def you write classes. That's pretty much the same as other language. It has a mixed ob object-oriented and functional, so you can use both like object-oriented classes and interfaces and inheritance. And you can use also like functional programming, like function as values, functional types, um, method binding, a lot of different functional things you can use. X is not pure object-oriented. In pure object-oriented, everything is an object. That's a nice idea, somehow I like the, the theory of it, but in practice it doesn't work. Most of the programming language, for efficiency reasons, introduce already basic types, which are not objects. And uh, sometimes you, there are things you cannot really uh, reason in terms of objects. So that's why Axe introduced uh, several different top-level types. We have class interfaces, so both of them are objects somehow. But we also type def, which are uh, alias to different types or shortcuts. We have a structure, which are a set of fields. So A, B, C, and with a type. We have an enum, which is what we see after, is a powerful construct to build uh, data structures. And we have an abstract, uh, which is in something new in X3.0 that enables you to write a wrapper around some types that hides the implementation details, but doesn't create any overhead in its course coding. So I will not introduce abstract today, but we can, we can look into the doc documentation if you want to know more about it. X has a very conservative syntax. Uh, it's not something really a uh, new, really new syntax that looks really uh, alien or uh, that you will need to learn from scratch. Uh, it really keeps uh, things like Java, JavaScript, or C used to do. Curly brace, it's enough, it works. Uh, one of the features of Axe, important features, is type inference. Type inference means that the compiler will guess the types for you, that most of the times you don't need to write the types. Let's have a look at this example. So this is a function, so this is Xcode. This is a function foo, it takes a k parameter. You create a, uh, a variable called sti called hello world. So here the compiler first will guess something already. He say, okay, I have a variable and then I assign a string to it. So of course, the type of the variable is a string. Done. Second, second, uh, second uh, line, var a equal uh, empty array. So we know it's an array. And in X, uh, array have a type for the content. So right now it's an array of unknown, which means that we don't know yet what goes inside the array, but we will maybe know as soon as we start typing further. So we'll iterate from uh, zero to K. We'll split the string into space and for each word we'll push into the array. Okay. So now, we start pushing things into an array of unknown, and we push a string into the array of unknown. So, of course, if we start putting things, uh, putting strings into an, this array, it becomes an array of string, because we know that we put string into it, so it must be an array of string, and we return the array. So you can see here, we have written zero type, but then the compiler will uh, know when it compiles the things that the function take a k which is int because we have been uh, doing a iteration here. This is an iterator in x from 0 to k. So it means that k is an integer here. And uh, here we're iterating a which we have been guessing it's an array string. So most of the time you will write code like this in x, which is n almost no typing. And you get still the compi uh, compiler is safety and very meaningful error message when you are doing something wrong. So that's really very helpful. Uh, when I when I I have been doing a lot of Java before, and uh, sometimes you feel you're fighting against the type system and against the language. You want to do something, but the compiler will not let you to. So you have to do a lot of cast and a lot of things like this. This is not the case in Axe. In Axe, we think that compiler is an ally, not an enemy. 
So you have to, he's here to help you, to give you uh, good insights on your code and not to prevent you from doing things that you would, would like to do otherwise. So that's also an important thing. Uh, one example of this uh, actually applied, uh, that the compiler will let you do something when you say you want to do that. It's a c what we call almighty dyna dynamic. So you can type any variable uh, as dynamic. For example, so I write uh, x dynamic equal something. So here I specify the type. I say this is dynamic. So first thing is that when it's dynamic, I can put any value into it. There will be no check. Because it's dynamic, it can receive anything. And because it's dynamic, I can do anything with X. I can access the fields, I can call, I can do whatever, I can do the most stupid things with X. But it's at your own risk. So if you know what you are doing, if you know that the X is actually something coming from a database or from an external file or JSON or something, you just want to access the fields and you know that it will be okay because you trust yourself and you know that your program has other parts being checked. So the compiler will trust you and say, okay, he, he puts dynamic, he knows what he's doing, I will let it do. Okay? So uh, this will also give you directly unchecked platform access, which means that everything you do with dynamic is platform specific. You get the platform specific behavior. So if you, for instance, you are add two dynamics, like a, a string and an array together, usually it's not possible uh, with Axe because it's say uh, you cannot add a string and an array. Oh, actually you can, okay. An int and an array. You say, okay, it's not possible. But if there is uh, some very specific, in for instance, in some crazy uh, platform that you want to do something by adding an int and an array, this is possible with dynamic, okay? It will fall back on the platform behavior for that. If you want to use cross-platform reflection and things like that, there is an API for that, which is cross-platform, which is meant it is guaranteed to is tested to tested to to work the same on all the platforms. But when you do dynamic, you do a lot of other things. Another feature we had is structural subtitling. That might sound a bit barbaric for people that are not so much into type theory, but it's all called duct typing. Maybe you know duct typing better than structural subtitling. It's the same thing. So. We look, this is a type def, uh, any point, it has two fields, x float and y float. So we will just define, uh, this type def. So this is a new, a new type we design and we name it any point. And we have a function which takes a distance between two any points. So we make the difference between the x and y and the, you create the square root. So this classical distance function, if you're into game programming, you know this from sure. Then, because of structurized typing, I can of course pass this, which is a valid value for any point. It has a x float and a y float, so I can push this. But I can also pass any class instance that have these two fields. As soon as the class has these two fields, I can pass any instance of it. So it's a, it's a way to somehow, you're not relying on inheritance, you're not relying on uh, point extending base base point or something or abstract point or something. So this is more like you know you define the fields like constraints like the fields you want uh, that are required, and as soon as something has these fields, you can pass to it. Okay, so that's to try to try that set of things. Um, we have more features in Axe language. Uh, we have iterators. So for e in anything that have an iterator method, which is called an iterable. You can iterate on it simply. So an array, for instance, for e in my array, and that's it. Uh, we have string interpolation. So you can uh, have uh, values like, here we are inserting the value of the variable x into the string, and here we are putting a more complex expression into the curly brace. So for example, if x is five, it will put it will print the value of x is five and the square is twenty-five. We have a array comprehension, so it's a, a way to create an, an array on the fly. So you will iterate from zero to ten and uh give the value i. And this create an array with all the values that goes into loop. 
Okay, so from 0 to 10, you can add this, and so this gives you this array, okay, which is also typed as array of int automatically. And we can you can use also like, okay, I will take my array that I've been creating from 0 to 9 for x in array, if x mode 3 equals 0, x. So I can do a filter here, and this will only filter the values that uh, are true with x, okay? That's the kind of nice things you get with the language. Uh, enums. Enums is another like interesting feature from Axe. Uh, this is a color enum. So usually in most of the language, you will get only the first three case, which is okay, I can put values, and this is a different values that you can use for an enum. But in Axe, you can put more things. You can put, for instance, gray, and here you put a parameter, which is an amount of gray. Or you can have another case, which is a mix between two colors. Okay? So you can have a very different things. I don't have my example. So basically you can create uh, enums between blue, being red, or being gray of 0 0.5, or being a mix of blue and gray, and red, sorry. So you can have a lot of different values. And then you can use pattern matching to get back the value. So here's a value that gets the value of the color. So you switch on the color. If it's red, this is this value. This is a red uh, hexadecimal value. If it's green, this is this. If it's blue, it's this. If it's gray, of V. And here, V will capture, is a, vi is a new variable, like you declare a variable, that will capture the amount of gray that was specified. Okay? So here we uh, put the we calculate the amount of gray and we return the corresponding gray color. Well, this is a bit of bit shifting, not very. You don't have to get that exactly, but we important this is this that you, ca you capture the values here. And it mix is another example is that we get two colors A and B. We get we call get color and uh, of A and get color of B, and then we mix the two together. Okay. So mixed color is not defined here. Get color actually should be get value. It's uh, an error. And uh, here, that we can recurse and have uh, this kind of thing. So it's pretty interesting um, encoding data structures. Uh, one important thing is that given all the platforms we are targeting, we had to be very careful about the way we design the language. So Axe has been designed from scratch to run very efficiently on every platform. So let's look at examples, properties. Have a have as a X as a property uh, system, so you can create. This is a class. You create a member variable age with the type int, and you have two accessors is here saying get and set. Okay, so it means that when you access for reading, you will call get age, and when you access for writing, you call set age with the value. Okay, this is auto automatic. So you just have after you can write user dot age plus plus for instance, and which say it will translate to uh, set age of get age plus one. Okay. So this is the way we design properties, and uh, the thing is that in Axe properties are replaced by function calls at compilation time, which means that when you write uh, actually uh, user dot age equal five, you actually writing user dot set age of five. Okay. That's the same thing. The thing, uh, the, the way we design this is that to ensure that even if the platform doesn't have native support for properties, and a lot of platform doesn't have that, we can really implement properties in a very efficient manner because they are already translated at compilation, and the later at runtime we don't need to make any check about does this value has a property? Do we fetch the like getter and setter. So it's very efficient. Yeah, there's much more in the manual. Another example of uh, usage of Axe is uh, TiVo. Do you know TiVo? Who knows TiVo? Quite a few. TiVo is a very uh, big company in the US. Uh, they are making a kind of digital VCR, DVR, 
you can uh, actually like uh, record a lot of different TV shows. You have a set of box that can do a lot of different uh, things with your uh, with your uh, with your recordings and TV. So it's kind of very smart TV. So they have this set of box and they have a lot of uh, millions of u of users, and they they, they are they port uh, the whole UI, which is uh, more than one million line of code into Axe, uh, because that enables them to get better performances and to also uh, bring the, the software to new platforms. So that's really something they are really happy with it. They get uh, released, uh, I think it was early uh, this uh, summer, early summer, they get a new version out. And they had the really good feedback from the customer. It's like they upgrade the CPU of their of the set of box without changing the hardware. People get from like twice the FPS or something. So like, and also because they have, uh, they have port their code base to Axe, it means that they can start reusing all the UI stuff they've been doing, all the like, all the, the logic they have been creating to handle the catalogs of uh, shows. And for instance, if they want to access uh, or display the same thing on mobile or on tablet, then they c everything is already here. They just need to rework the U UI stuff and the kind of events, but the whole, the, the whole code base is already there. They have to customize maybe a bit things because you can't just you know, take it and run it. So it's not about taking an application and running it somewhere else. It's more about being able to get the code, add, re re rework it in a way that runs nicely on a, on a new platform. Okay, so it's not like kind of quick and dirty copy and paste and it's done. It's more about you have this code base, you know you can read, run it on all the platforms. Do you want it to? If you want to, adapt it so it can run in the most uh, in the best way. Okay. Stand library. Everything is fine? Yeah? What? Yeah? Okay. Stand library. Extend library, uh the the wall idea behind it is like X come with batteries include. So we're not trying to have a very minimalist library that does almost nothing and that you have to download a lot of different libraries uh, all over the internet. Uh, it's cross-platform. So all of our standard library is cross-platform, which means that it runs the same on all the platforms we target. We have a lot of specification we have specified this in documentation and it's unit tested, which is important too. So we have like a lot of unit tests for language and uh, behaviors and also standard library that runs on the Travis continuous, continuous ent integration framework. And so every time we do a commit, it will check everything, all the thousands of tests on all the like tens of platforms we have or something. Okay, different OS and everything. So it's quite solid. This is the kind of thing we have in the standard library. So you have a string class, array, array takes a, ty a type parameter. We have a map, which is a way to map keys to values. Date, math, for all the math function. Bytes to manipulate binary data, XML, JSON, reflection, access to, types, to the types, to the class names and everything. Regular expression, HTTP, Unicode, still in progress, but we're getting there. Serialization, cryptography, like access to zip files, to binary I.O. Well, those kind of things we have, you know, all the things that are actually data structures are kind of not tied to a specific display or a specific device. They fit perfectly in the standard library. They can be specified, they can be tested, and they can be exactly the same on all the platforms because there is no reason they are different. There is no reason to do like regular expression depending on the platform in a different manner, for instance. Okay, that's a pure logic, right? And we also have a platform specific package in the standard library. So you have this kind of co uh, top level package and the Axe package, which are cross platform. And then we have a platform specific package. So for instance, we have the gs.html package, which is a wall HTML5 API, which is entirely typed. So you can use directly from Axe uh, entirely typed. 
We have also the a sys package, which is a cross-platform system library. So you get all the file system access to read and write files on the hard drive, list the directories, browser, browser directories, etc. And you can create processes and run process, run commands and get the results. And do a bit of networking also, create a server, a socket, a row socket. So this system library is uh, only available on the what we call the system platforms. So because, for instance, in JavaScript, if you're running inside the browser, you cannot access the file system. You cannot access the, di the directories of the users, uh, browse its files. Uh, hopefully, you can do that. Um, and uh, so only for C++, Java, C Sharp, PHP, this kind of what we call the system platforms, you can access uh, this, uh, this package. There is some ways, for instance, some people have been porting the sys uh, library for Node.js, so you are still targeting JavaScript, but you run into Node uh, Node.js, and so you have a file system access, and you can do these kind of things. The full API of the standard library, you can check it on api.x.org. We have documentation for all the API, and you can browse it. You will see a lot of package because there is one package for each platform, plus package for cross level uh, cross platform API. How is the standard library implemented? Some people say, okay, no, I, you have a, a, this, this feature, it's cross platform, but how do I do the same? Mostly it's used uh, using conditional compilation. So it's an example. Uh, we have a function print, which take a string, and we use uh, conditional compilation to say, okay, if I'm on JavaScript, I will call the browser console and I will call log the output. As if I'm on the sys platform, I will use sysprintlen, which output on the system output. Else, I will say no supported for this platform. But I could do a lot of different ways of things. Of course, we don't have actually the code in the standard library right in this way. That will be very difficult to maintain. So we have actually one class per platform and uh, a ways to optimize things and to check that uh, the API is respected. But that's the idea. You write, you, and you can, you can write this in your code. So basically, people will do like this. You will just write your code logic in a cross-platform manner. And when you have some very specific functions, such as, for instance, a display class, you will get several implementation, which is per platform implementation. So you can have, for instance, uh, an HTML5 display that use a uh, HTML5 API. And you can have a, a mobile display that use a uh, WebGL, for instance, or, or GSL, OpenGL. And you compile with one or the, or the other, depending on which platform you target. But your whole code logic remains the same. So that's an important thing there, that you can keep a, a good part of your code uh, between the platforms. So with this, you can encapsulate, which means that the uh, implementation details does not, does not leak. Because here the function print is just take a string. You don't know what happens behind the curtains. And you can reuse, which means that once it's written, you can reuse it in di different projects. And you can extend it later for more platforms. Okay? And you can optimize, actually. Because if you add uh, this inline keyword, this means that every time you call the function, it will replace in your code by the actual code that was written inside the function. So you, you will not have the extra cost of coding a function. OK? This is optimization. So a lot of standard libraries is using that to make sure that you are accessing an API that looks solid. But in the end, it will design lot, a lot of code, in, lots of things in your code. And it makes your code run as fast as if, have, uh, if you have written like native code. OK? <coughs> Uh, cross compiler. X runs with a cross compiler, which is a, it's a compiler that runs, that cross compile your X code for a given platform. It's not a black magic. So, who's ready for a very quick compiler course? Yeah? Okay. So, I will teach you how to write a compiler in 10 minutes. Is this cool? 
So it's really not black magic. So I want to explain what goes actually, what's going on. We'll try to compile that. Okay, this is a, a small expression. We'll not try to compile a world class, just a small expression. Okay, if value is more than fifty-eight, print hello plus world. Oh, this is a very not very interesting example, but we should get started somewhere, right? So the first step is called a uh, lexing. Is that we will separate? Okay, this is uh, we get that from program, so it's just a string. We get this string of which is a uh, an array of characters or something. So the first thing is to make sense of this text. So we will uh, do something which is called lexing. So we will separate this string into small units that we call tokens. A token is a, can be a keyword, can be a, a special character, an operator, it can be a number, it can be uh, different things. Okay. So if we lex our, our string, we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 tokens. And good? Yeah. So we translate our string into a list of tokens. Okay? Now we have tokens. So with the tokens, we do something else, which call, so these are our tokens, and we will pass the token into something which called an AST. The AST is an abstract syntax tree. So that might sound a bit barbaric. It's actually pretty easy. That's this. So let's try to see how it works. We take the if, it's come at the top. We saw we know that the if it has two things going on, it has the condition and the what is run if the if is true. So we have two branch. On the left you have the condition, on the right you are you have the expression that gets run if the if is true. Let's go on the left. On the left we are inside the condition, so inside we are inside the value is more than sixty eight. Here you have two you have an operator. Operator means is compared two things, the things on the left with the things on the right. Okay? So you have operator and on the left you have value, on the right you have your your constant. Okay? We are done. Now on the right we have a, a call. We have a call to print. And uh, a parameter. Parameter is against a value that has a, a plus operation with something on the left, something on the right. So we're adding the two strings. Okay? Everybody get this? So that's actually the memory representation of a program by a compiler. This is what does a compiler. It transforms your string, your program string, into this representation. And this representation after, it will perform operations on it. So the next operation will be to type check. So we will have a typer that checks the program and give types to everything. Because we are ty a, a strictly typed programming language, so we need to learn about types and to check things to give programmer errors if something is wrong. Okay? So what we do is that is this. We start from the if, we go on the left, again on the bottom, value, we check if it e exists. Okay? Oh, actually is declared, Let's say it's declared. And it's uh, an integer, okay? So it exists and it's again integer. So we put the integer uh, the integer type here. Here. 58. It's an integer. We know that. When you compare two integer, you get a Boolean. Okay? So it's true or false. And actually if only accept in Axe only accept Booleans as a condition. Okay? If you write uh, if 58, it will say int should be bool. It will complain. Okay? X is quite strict about this. Let, mm, let's say save a lot of typing uh, errors from the product developer. Then, okay, we have typed this. Now we can go on the other way, other side, which is what do we execute? So we go against, we first go into the most deep, deep and then we go back up. So we go here. Hello is a string. We go here. 
wall is a string, if I had two strings together, the result, the result is a string. Okay? And print takes a string as parameter. We check that and we know it's cool. It works because we saw that we have declared print with a string method. If it was something else, it would complain that uh, we are accepting a string and you're putting something else. And it re re returns void. And we don't know. And we, of, co of course, we have checked that print exists in our context. Okay? Everything got that? Everyone got that? I told you it's, it's easy to write a compiler. Then we are optimizer. An optimizer, it will optimize the IST. So it will turn that into that. So you see that there is two constant strings between being added together. I say, we don't need to do every time the add, every time the call the program. Let's do it now, one and for all, and we're done. If we had the same, if we had this here, uh, 59, it will look that 59 is, mo is always larger than 58. So it will replace this by true, because it's always true. And if always true, it will remove the wall part and only keep the print hello world. Okay? So that's the kind of optimization the Axe compiler is doing, which is very nice. So this is that right now we don't know the value because it's a variable. So we are not sure it's always more than 59, 58. So we'll keep it as it. And this is op optimized uh, IST. So it was a very small optimization. And then once we have done that, we have a generator that translates the IST to the target language. So for instance, it will write in PHP if value more than 68, 50, 68, like trust in the world. Or in Python, maybe if you write that, etc. Okay? You got what Axe is doing. You know you understand it. There is no black magic, okay? The good, the good ways, the good like points about Axe is that it sanitizes any language. By sanitizing, I mean it brings a, a powerful type system. It corrects all the issues a language might have because it's a very whole language that's been developing, uh, developed um, more or less uh, sanely. Um, <coughs> then it's it allow, allow you to, since you're targeting the platform natively, you can keep the existing runtime. You can still run on the PHP VM or on Java VM if you're using Java. And you can access the libraries of this for this platform as well. The only drawback is that if you access a native library, then when you're doing that, if you want at some point to run the same code on other, on other platform, you will need also this library to be available or to write a replacement or something else. Okay? But at first, if you want to want to go with one single platform, you can use a library on this platform. It's possible. As a team, it's a wonderful programming language because when you want when you work as a team and uh, with different aspects, some people working on the server side, some working on the client side, on JavaScript, or if everybody speaks the same language, like I mean literary, then it's much, it makes things much more easy because it means that if I have a bug in your code, I can maybe fix it much more easily because I know the language. And uh, we can share some code. For instance, let's say you have a client software that does a lot of validation when you, the user t like types something or does some action in your game or something else. It you do a lot of validation on client side. And then you want to do the same validation on the server side because, you know, you can't, even if the client bypass your checks, you want still to check that things are correct. Usually you, ri you write things both, once in uh, JavaScript, for instance, for the client side, and once write once again on the PHP or Java or anything you're using on the server side. But you have to keep the two validation doing exactly the same thing because if you validate something on the client as they don't validate on the server, that's a bug for the user, okay? With Axe, you can actually write the validation 
in Axe once, and you can compile it both on the client and both on the server. And it's the same code base. You maintain one single code base, which is nice. So, but also, uh, uh, also having uh, uh, this, uh, this actually was my my last my next point. But you can reuse your code uh, on different platforms and on in different ways. Okay. But having the team be, uh, be able to communicate using the same programming language means also you can, uh, usually when you want to communication between two like different parts of your technology, you have to write protocols for communicating because, you know, you send uh, XML or JSON or whatever you are sending or protocol buffers. So you are sending data and you need to kind of specify things or I will send you this kind of data and you have to parse it and send it back again. With Axe, it's pretty easy. You just define the data structure and you say, okay, we are sending this data. This is Axe data. And that's done. You don't need to work on the, we have a serializer that works all the platforms. So you serialize on one side, you unserialize on the other side. The types, the types are the same. The class are the same. You just exchange in data. Pretty, pretty easy. Uh, it's easier to maintain. Uh, like compared to some other programming language, and it's a it's good for the long term uh, because you are sure that if there is new platforms coming up, you will not have to port your whole code base. You will just have to wait a bit that we bring the new <laughs> platform, which is pretty easy to do, honestly. And it's very fast. That's one important thing. The compiler is hopefully fast. Very, very. You can't, you can't imagine. Like it's like thousands of class. You, you cannot see the. Usually, you cannot see the compiler running. You get, or maybe you get. If you get an error, you see it. But if you don't get an error, you get the output and it's done. It's uh, process really a lot of classes in a very, very efficient way. There are a few drawbacks. Of course, I will not try to add it, so I will list you uh, the most important as the ones that things are, are still we are working on. The first is to debug. When you have a bug, right now we don't have a, an unified solution, an unified debugger to uh, debug your Xcode on all the targets. Okay. Some targets have things working. For instance, we have a source map support for JavaScript. So when you debug in Chrome, you will get you will be able to step in your Xcode directly but from uh, from some other targets we don't have this okay so you might have depending on the target to debug the generated code okay but we feel it's fair because uh, we are trying to mod to make the generated code easy to read some solution exists for uh, some comp some platforms and uh, by code platforms such as ja uh, flash Neko, and maybe su C sharp and Java have not the problem because we are generating bytecode and in bytecode we put the position in terms uh, of file and file and line number uh, corresponding to the X file. Okay. Other drawback is that the tooling is perfectly bon. We are not yet as much good as Java or something that's been using for years by many many different uh, companies. Uh, for instance. IDE support with for refactoring for a lot of advancing advanced uh, transformations is not easy. it's not the AZ for Axe, but we're working on it, working on uh, currently on uh, improving uh, Axe support for IntelliJ plugin for IntelliJ uh, IDE, trying to bring it to very uh, high uh, professional level. So these are the two main drawbacks, I guess, when you start using Axe. They are not shop shoppers, but you should be aware of it if you want to use it. Ah, okay. We have also very nice features, additional features in the compiler. One is the powerful dead code elimination. So dead code elimination, what it does is that it takes your wall program, it will just walk it through it and check and remove all the bits that are not used, uh, not actually used. So you have a big class with 20 methods, and your program actually used three of them. It will remove 17 methods. Okay. So this is very useful when you want to ship small binaries. 
or small uh, JavaScript code, for instance. This is how you activate it. By default, it's only enabled to uh, remove the extra code from the standard library, so the bits of the standard library you don't use. But you can activate it on your own code as well by doing dead code elimination for so the compiler parameter. At this point, your whole code base is entirely subject to, de to being dead code eliminated, which is pretty. Uh, it's really reduced, usually it's re you reduce by two or three times your code size. Because even if you have uh, something that is being well developed, you have libraries and you don't use the whole functionality of the libraries, or you have uh, some old code that you don't don't use anymore. There are always a lot of code uh, that is not all actually used. But because of the of the compilation, you can you can know that. Okay. We have something called uh, code completion. Code completion is a is a way to uh, to get you a completion when you hit a, a dot after an object or a value or something. Um, we have this as a compiler service, which means that because of the XTI system is quite complex, uh, you have a lot of possibilities. It means that uh, the IDE is a, maybe you have sometimes a, have hard time to figure out what are the fields for this particular value. For instance, type inference. You have seen type inference, we infer a lot of the variables. And of course, if uh, we want the IDE to uh, display completion after type inference, it means that the IDE would have in theory to do the type inference himself to guess the type at a given point. So that would be very hard for every IDE to do that. So we have implemented con completion as a compiler service, which means that you can ask the compiler the completion at a given point, and it works pretty well. So it's very easy to integrate completion into uh, IDEs, and it's very it's, and it's very accurate because this is what the compiler is actually doing. We have something which is called compilation cache server. So the code is the compiler is very fast, but sometimes when you get into the tens of thousands of class, it can be a bit uh, takes a few seconds to compile. So we have a compilation cache server, which is a, um, a way to cache your whole compilation and your all your class and everything into memory. <coughs> Sorry. And then uh, you just compile the things that have been changed, and that's it. And because we have this kind of compilation into memory, you can also use this to get very quick results for code completion. Because if you have very big, uh, if you, even if you have a small, for instance, if you have a small, uh, medium-sized code base, having uh, 100 or 200 milliseconds of compilation is not a problem. But having 100 or 200 milliseconds for code completion when you hit dot is not very nice. You want it to pop up immediately. And that's what the compilation cache server is for. And we have something which calls macros. So I put a little warning sign here uh, because it's at the same time it's powerful and dangerous. So I feel it's uh, accurate to use with care. But before going to that, we will show another example. Uh, this is a game uh, I've been making uh, last year, uh, like last year, too, with my company. It's called Evil End. It basically, it's a game with three different uh, <coughs> you have different like graphics evolving as you go in the game. First, you start you start with a uh, uh, black and white pixels in Game Boy style, and then you uh, as you open the chest, you, the graphics evolve. You start getting the colors and new uh, new like monsters and uh, then save points and the music and everything. Every time you get a chest, uh, the, the game change. So it's a game. It's a game about the history of games because you start from the good old days of old consoles and you go up to 3D, and uh, then after you get into 3D mode and you fight a big boss in full 3D. And well, that's a game about evolution. So it's entirely writing in Axe. Took us uh, four and a half months to do that. It has been sold like uh, 400k units on Steam. Which is pretty good for independent games, small studio. We are four people working on this game. 
And uh, so yeah, that's a good example of a good game. It uses open source uh, apes.io engine, which is our engine for displaying 2D and 3D things. Uh, it's still in, it's not yet really released. There is no documentation and things like this, but we are working on it to bring it uh, to a nice level of usability. Macros. Here we are. So I will try to be uh, as as clear as possible. Usually, when you think macros, you think maybe who know but macros in other language. Not that much. Okay. Usually, macros is just a way. Okay, I define uh, tree to be zero point one or something. So and it replaces a value uh, a symbol by a value. So it's just a way to define things. Well, that's not what X macros are. I will show you an example. It comes from a uh, source code of Everland. We have this class, it's called uh, HXD REST. It's to access the resources of your game. So we have a special directory uh, where we put all the assets of our game. Uh, we put the sounds, the, mu the music, the graphics, the 3D models, the textures. We put everything in this special directory. And when you want to ask completion, on this uh, directory, you will get that. So you, you will actually get the content of your directory. So you have a SFX and music folder, and you have a hero and monster, which are two files. So, and you get that in code completion when you hit dots. So, which means that something in the background that have been browsing this directory and created a code for you to access this. And here, if you uh, select hero and do this, because hero is a, is a PNG image, you have access to this uh, tile, texture, bitmap functionalities. So it's, it means that it lists the content and depending on the file extension, it will give it a type that depends for, for image you will get this to convert to uh, texture and uh, to uh, for sounds you will have a I think we have some some example well, okay if you go SFX earth you will have a to, to something which will play okay you play the sound so a macros are a compile time compilation time code generator which means that it's a program that is run at compilation time. While you're compiling your, your code, you run some code that generates other code. Macros can access the hard drive, so you can list your files on your hard drive. You can access your types, so all the code you've been defining in your, co in your, in your code, like in your, in your program, like you can access and uh, inspect this and see what you've been doing. So we can extract data from your types, from your code. It can modify the IST. You see the IST, like the, the program tree? The macro can modify it. So it can look at this and say, okay, I want it this way, and ch change the order of things or insert new code. So it's a program that manipulates another program. You cannot change the syntax. That's the only restri restriction. You cannot introduce new syntax. You have to keep the hack syntax. So let's look a, a quick look at different things that's been done with macros. This one is a uh, is called Spod. It's an uh, object uh, Russian. Uh, Management, so it's a way to bind uh, like uh, classes to uh, database uh, files, uh, database uh, uh, tables. Sorry. Um, so here you write some X code, and you will use it here uh, a X condition. But actually, because you are in this select function, and that select function is a macro, it will. Uh, makes a different meaning of this parameter. 
instead of saying uh, that you there is no variable dollar h and no variable dollar name it will look check that this variable are actually defined in the user class and it will check that the, con the you are using them correctly for instance here you are comparing uh, the integer variable with this uh, integer value and here you are looking for a search name which is a string and what it does is that it will compile this as a SQL query okay so you get both the checking compile time checking of this because if your user class if you make a typo and your user class doesn't have an age or name it will make an error and you get also like compilation to SQL automatically no code injection no kind of things like this okay uh, we have actually something called HXR, which is a macro based shader for GPU programming. Basically, you can write this kind of things. It's also perfectly valid X code. You project a vector with a model view projection of the camera. If you do some GPU programming, you know what this. And actually, this you write this in X, so it's uh, compatible. It looks really much like GLSR if you're doing, doing that, which is a OpenGL uh, shading language, but it's writing in Axe. You get all the like compilation check at compile time in Axe, and uh, it's uh, g after you can generate uh, GLSL code at runtime. Another things you can check on castledb.org. It's a um, database. That you that you create uh, with a tool, and that you you write a lot of you define a lot of a lot of uh, uh, different uh, sheets like in Excel, and we each sheets have different columns, and then you get all the types that have been defined. This you can get easily them have them in uh, into your X context uh, without typing any code. So. Another example of uh, macros. Uh, this is quite an advanced example. But basically, it enables you to do that, which is rebinding different words of the Axe language in to do something else. So here we are making actually uh, like the, it's done uh, using a uh, metadata, which is uh, a way to uh, put some data that is usually ignored by the compiler. So usually everything here is ignored by the compiler. Okay, so we have two variables here and here until and whatever they are ignored by the compiler. So they don't have any meaning for X. But the macro can capture that and can make a meaning of it and generate some code based on that. So you can see you can turn that into a a lot, a lot of functions, like embrocated functions, and uh, for asynchronous code. So, of course, this is a bit abusing metadata. I, f I feel because uh, we are getting quite far from the actual X syntax. But if you are want to look at the different uh, possibilities that you can do with macros, look at the tin Tinklang library. It will show you that different kind of things that are done with macros to modify and to somehow change the language in different ways. So you don't have to use macros. You can use X, X as it. But if you want to really customize and have really uh, powerful libraries that has a lot of code generation, macros is definitely a big plus. Well, yes, it's a, that's a meme we have in the Axe community. We say there's a macro for that. So for every special need you might have, there is a possibility to write a macros that does exactly that. That's uh, and uh, so far it's that still proven true. I mean, we every question that people have been asking on the mailing list for the past two or three years. Sometimes there is already a solution in the language, and or sometimes it's a bug and it can be fixed. But just when sometimes the language has not been designed for that. There's still a macro to do that. 
that's quite uh, kind of power you get with macros. Okay, tools and libraries. We're almost done. We have many tools. Uh, IDS support, we have Flash Develop, Sublime Text, IntelliJ, etc. Not perfect integration, but we're getting better. We have uh, generic libraries for code coverage, unit texting, documentation generation, all kinds of things. You can check lib.x.org, which is uh, our package manager for libraries. You use it like way, this way. When you install Ax, you can do Axlib install the name of the library. It gets installed and you can use it. That's as easy as it is. Uh, Ax can be used in different ways. So you can use Ax as a low level things to write cross platform libraries or cross platform applications. Or you can use it as a high level by using an already existing cross-platform API. People have been writing a lot of different API with Axe. So we have, here's a few of them for games or for like displaying things. OpenFL is a, is an implementation of the Flash API. So you get all the Flash API or most of it in a cross-platform manner, which means you can use the Flash API on mobile. Well, you could do that with Air if you know about Flash, but uh, with Air you run inside the virtual Flash virtual machine or with the IoT, which is not very good. With OpenFL, it compiles to C++ and it runs natively on mobile, which is has no comparable uh, speed compared to Flash. Yeah? You have a Flamby, which is a HTML5 oriented uh, framework, so very good for all the things of HTML5 oriented. I think, uh, yeah, it's used by uh, Disney and uh, Nickelodeon in the in the US. They've been doing, I think, uh, more than 150 games with Framby already. You have uh, Xflixel, which is another high high level library because it runs on top of an OpenFL, but it has its own uh, API. Ips.io. I'm working on this. It's still not released, but with there. Uh, Stencil. Stencil is a tool. Uh, it's not meant for programmers. Uh, it's meant for people that want to learn programming or that want to learn to make games. Uh, it's uh, you know it's like Scratch. You just put the blocks to blocks of programming together, but it's entirely uh, based on on Ax. So if you want to extend it, you can use the Ax code. And this one is a rich. It's called Rich 3DX. It's a Professional game engine for 3D engine games made by the people that do the Gamebryo engine, which is pretty popular for AAA games. And they are making a new engine uh, for mobiles and cross platform using Axe. Entirely writing in Axe, too. Uh, maybe you know this game? We know this game. Papers, please. One of the most uh, acclaimed uh, independent games last year. And Papers, please, is writing in Axe. That's something, maybe. Um, for if you want to write choose X for web server development, you can use a sysdb ORM. You can look for documentation for this. We have template systems. We have a uh, application server for NecoVM, or you can use uh, PHP or Java uh, technologies for that. We are working on uh, something we call Ufront, which is a framework to unify all these things and have a kind of common X web framework uh, to do better JavaScript. You can use uh, just plain Axe with uh, all the like HTML5 API. We have a JS.jQuery which is gives you the fully typed uh, jQuery API, which is always nice. You can easily extend uh, and access any library by writing externs. Extern class extern is an extern class, so you just say extern class and you just write the API of the class without any implementation and that's it. Once it's written once, you can use it in your program and it will just compile to the class access that is defined in JavaScript. Okay. Uh, it, when you're doing a GS, you have a lot of flexibility. I mean, so by default, uh, only, only the code you're, you're including is compiled. 
and you can uh, actually reduce it a lot with a dead code compilation, dead code elimination. But if you want, for instance, to split the code into several GS files or to have several outputs, it's possible. You have a lot of possibility to filter class, filter out class in the GS output uh, to combine things in different ways. So you actually get to, cho to choose what you generate in the output. And you can use this here for large code bars. And of course, you can use X for mobile apps, desktop apps, common line apps, whatever. So there's a lot of different possibilities. I think we have not yet explored all the things we can do with that. So in short, we're getting almost done. Uh, S can be used alone as a technology. It can be used with high level libraries if you'd want to want to go into the technical details. It can be used to develop many different things, many different platforms. That's maybe true for any language, but that's particularly true for Axe. Uh, you can use it to write the next successful cross-platform library. That's definitely a good tool for that. And uh, while that's the goals we had at first, I think we we have reached all of them. A few words about us. Uh, X Foundation has been created uh, two years ago. Uh, it's managed it's managed uh, X evolution and it's uh, 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 make sure that the uh, bugs get fixed, you know, <laughs> like tickets get answered and everything, and that we working on the next uh, evolution of the language. It's a really long term investment. Uh, we've been doing X for I've been doing X for more than almost ten years now, not yet, but. And uh, and we we here for the long term. We're not into like like uh, no like startup things or this kind of way. Uh, it's entirely financed by our partners, which are companies we, uh, which are using Axe on a daily basis, and they want to support the technology. So we're getting money from them. A part of the money go to uh, making a support for them. A part of the money goes into the language to uh, improve uh, everything uh, for the community. And it's entirely open source. So if you have any question and want to use X in your company, you can contact us. If you have some details you don't want to to reveal. Uh, and thank you.